Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of the Bay of the Beltway and the Bay, a webinar series we're producing in partnership with the U.S. Department of Commerce. Today, I'm very excited to be moderating a discussion with Dr. Sarah Kapnick, the Chief Scientist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, commonly referred to as NOAA. Dr. Kapnick has extensive experience at the intersection of climate science and economics. Most recently, she served as managing director at JP Morgan in the role of senior climate scientist and sustainability strategist for asset and wealth management. And while at JP Morgan, she supported sustainability and climate action efforts and served as an advisor on new business and investment opportunities and risk. And before we begin, I wanna remind members of the audience listening into this webinar that they have the ability throughout the conversation to submit questions via the webinar question box uh, that you can see on the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many of these questions as possible once we get to that stage in the discussion. One last notice, my child's preschool teacher called in sick today. So if at some point in the next hour, uh, our discussion is crashed by a four-year-old in a Spider-Man costume behind me, don't be shocked, everything is under control. With that, Dr. Kapanek, welcome to uh, the Bay Area Council Beltway and the Bay Series. I'm excited to be here, and Adrian, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know we have. Maybe we'll get some viral moments. Well, first, why don't why don't we start, Dr. Kapanek, by let me just inviting you to provide a, a brief overview of NOAA's strategy to strengthen the nation's climate resilience and progress made towards implementation over the past few years. And then we'll get into some more detailed questions about specific climate stressors and NOAA's role. Yeah, I um, when you asked me in a comment on that, that is, that is our agency. This is what we're thinking about and what we're producing for the nation is the science and technology needed to understand the Earth system and be able to make it usable to use it for all um, decisions relating to that information. I think is a slight step back, it might be helpful if I say, what is in NOAA? So our mission as an agency is science, producing science, service, making sure that we're getting that science into the hands of users, and stewardship. So making sure that we also use it to ensure healthy oceans. Um, and that's also majorly through fisheries, um, through our fisheries requirements. So under NOAA, we have six lines. Uh, first one I'll mention is NOAA Marine Fisheries Service. So we have fundamental R&D on fisheries and um, their health and habitat and ecosystems and restoration and conservation, but also we manage fisheries and we have one of the most sustainable fisheries in the world. So number two, we also have the National Ocean Service. So that's the nation's premier agency for oceans and coasts. It gives us all the information that we need in those coastal regions. Um, we also have information in ports. And so, you know, for transportation in San Francisco is one region that has an important port. So providing all the information on oceans and coasts. Then we have the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, which is, this is our main research hub where we're producing the research foundations that's across the entire agency and that has that connectivity across different lines of what we need to produce. Within this agency, within this um this uh, office, we also have fundamental climate modeling. You know, the birth of climate models came out of that part of the agency. We also have the National Weather Service, and that is where we're providing weather, hydrologic, and climate forecasts and warnings for the United States. It's our oper it's our major operational arm. Um, so when you're thinking about resilience in terms of short term, that is the part of the agency that is giving you those warnings in advance of events, so you can do things in advance to be able to reduce their impact. We also have the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, or NESDISH for short. And that's where we have our um, global environmental data. It's a housing for a lot of the data and services to provide that information. Um, we have regional offices around that. Like there is one regional office for the West um, and they help on a variety of things with businesses and with uh, different groups to make sure that they're getting access to all the climate information that they need and other information from NOAA. And, but it also in NESDIS houses our satellites, our operational satellites, and those are for operational weather sa satellites and monitoring of the earth um, that we need for all of our predictions and forecasts. I'll also add 
um, that we also have space weather satellites. We have satellites way out at L1 looking at the sun to know what weather is coming off of the sun, which is really important for the grid and GPS systems um, and, uh, and those effects. Um, and the last line office that we have is our NOAA Marine Aviation Operations, which is OMAO for short, which also houses one of the eight uniform services um, of the United States. Um, and those uh, uniformed men and women are the ones that fly into hurricanes and on the West Coast, they're flying into atmospheric rivers uh, before they hit shore. Um, and that information that we take out of those storms, that's how we're able to predict intensity um, and location of where those storms are going to be to also give those advanced warnings. And so those people flying into those storms and taking those measurements are the ones that make um, our data so good to be able to know in advance when the storms are coming through. They also man our ships and uh, crew our ships um, that do our fishery services, that do our mapping of the ocean floor, which are really important for transportation. Um, so we're collecting all this information and putting out all these forecasts and information and that allows us to react to things in the short term of minutes to hours to days, but then also going out to years, decades, um, even a century of understanding what the future holds. And the goal of the agency is to make sure that we're providing that information so people can use it and making sure that that information is really actionable. And by having offices in every single state and territory, um, we are you know, distributing that information all across the United States to make sure that people have what they need. The, the, thank you so much. Great answer to the question. Um, the data and the tremendous amount of data and quality and quantity of data that NOAA produces is is central to an underpinning uh, so much of our response. So we'll get into some some detail on that in a little bit, and I'm, I'm excited to do it. And I'm glad you led with it. But you know, first, I'm wondering if we can kind of stop kind of where the, the rubber meets the road on climate change in California. Here, we've been debating climate change through uh, some legislation on climate resilience bonds. And there's been a few different iterations from the governor's surplus climate package a few years ago, where it, it's pretty clearly now in California, we're targeting climate change with targeting wildfires and drought and extreme heat events and flooding, including sea level rise. So those four main buckets of climate stressors is how we're targeting it. Can you I'd like for you to go through each of those and discuss what NOAA brings to the table in strengthening California's resilience. And maybe we can start with flood and drought, the water ones, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, and I also say this is also personal for me. I don't, you didn't mention it in my bio, but I did my PhD at UCLA. I worked with um, for the state climate assessment many years. Um, California, in many ways, is at the forefront of experiencing many of the effects of climate change and many different types of effects, um, which has pushed you to have to deal with them faster than elsewhere. And so, you know, the rest of the country does look at what is happening in California and follows. Um, some of the examples of the thinking and thought leadership that you're producing on your action. So first on flood and drought, um, I wanted to comment at NOAA, we have a scientific goal uh, for advancing precipitation forecasting. Um, we call it our precipitation grand challenge to advancing our ability to uh, predict and project uh, precipitation on the timescales of days to months to seasons, um, and then going beyond with it production information for longer term planning. And specifically in your region, the Bay Area, we have a project called Advanced Quantitative Precipitation Information. And this regional project was awarded by NOAA in cl with collaborating partners um, with the California Department of Water Resources. They've been an amazing partner to us over the years on thinking through a lot of work on precipitation. And so this system and this work consists of improving weather radar data for precipitation estimation and short-term now casting. So that's from zero to one hours to know in advance before you have the events. But then there's additional surface measurements of precipitation, of stream flow, of soil measure, um, being integrated into this modeling to try and improve a suite of forecasting systems to improve lead times on both precipitation, but also coastal bay inundation from extreme storms, especially from atmospheric rivers, which are the storms that you have on the West Coast that really pack that precipitation punch. Um, on drought, I will say that um, 
across all of NOAA, we have something called um, drought.gov, which is run by the National Integrated Drought Information System. And this is bringing together all the drought information as a multi-agency partnership that NOAA leads to coordinate drought monitoring, forecasting, planning, and information for all federal, tribal, state, and local levels. Um, you can go onto the drought.gov website. You can see the current conditions of drought, and you can also see the predictions um, that are expected over the coming seasons. Mm -hmm. um, so this information is really important for um, uh, data sets where we say if drought is declared or not, and that is done at a very regional local level, um, but then also what is expected over the coming months. And that data from that drought.gov website does underpin a number of financial oh. projects that are relying upon a government source to declare drought or not um, in regions for parametric insurance and other products that are developed from that. I'll also say that um, in your region, uh, drought also affects you um, not just um, for water availability, um, and particularly in um, in California, you're concerned about the water availability um, in the region for the Bay Area. Um, it's you have the natural aqueduct there through the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And so drought can affect the amount of water that you have available coming through there, which supplies drinking water to almost 27 million residents. Um, but it also fuels your agricultural industry, which you all know, your $32 billion agricultural industry. Um, but on NOAA side, in addition to providing information to those groups for their management um, through NIDIS and through drought.gov, um, we are also managing the drought issues that come when there are the low flows of the fresh water um, related to um, your riverine systems in the Delta. So particularly in the Delta, there's more than 750 animal and plant species and 40 aquatic species. Um, and so drought uh, affects all of these, um, particularly um, in the aquatic species, important species of salmon, steelhead, and all those man and habitats are managed by NOAA. Um, and so low river flow and increased river temperatures when you have droughts and you also have hot summers, increases disease risk and reduces the survival of eggs and youth. And so there's a lot of work that we do across on making sure um, that those habitats are managed and the water is managed in a way that the fish are able to run. Um, going into now moving to kind of a related to drought, but wildfires. Um, so we provide a vital role supporting all of our partners on the, th on the threats, understanding um, threats for it months in advance um, and understanding the risks and climate change associated with it. Recently, Congress provided NOAA with 100 million over the next five years through the bipartisan infrastructure law to improve the prediction, detection and recovery from wildfires. Um, through this, we deploy, um, like actually for how this works on the ground beyond just the R&D to improve all our forecasting, we deploy our incident meteorologists to wildfire incident command posts when wildfires are happening at the request of emergency managers. And so when you're actually in a wildfire, we are deploying our people to go to these locations to assess with the emergency management as you're responding in the moment of the disaster. So are they um, embedded with like CAL FIRE or with the U.S. Department of Forestry or how does that work? Um, it is it is wherever they're needed and whenever they're requested. And so we work very closely with forestry um, and that is on the management side, but also um, uh, uh, state, local governments are also requested when they're responding to determining ev evacuation orders, determining what to do, where to go in their response. Um, and um, with this, um, with this, it's been it's you know been a growing concern in recent years as we've seen some years with the most wildfires that we ever have, particularly in California. And so we've been um, doing the training also in advance. We train the um, emergency managers how they need to prepare for the next one so they know who to call, what to do, how to coordinate. And then with the climate change information, um, local regions are figuring out, okay, if we expect fire risk to increase by this much, how do we need to plan? What do we do? So there's a planning that takes place before incidents, using that projection and that risk information, but also past experience from how we deal when you're in a disaster. So that when you're in the disaster and it starts happening, we can deploy our people quickly to go in and embed help with what they need on the forecast to be able to manage the fire risk and manage the evacuations and what needs to happen. And then after the events, 
um, they are still using the information to understand, okay, what was the risk of this event? What is the risk likely in the future? How is it changing? And how might we need to change operations going forward? And we work really closely to all of our federal managers on that too, like FEMA um, leads on the resilience response. And can I ask on the wildfire and NOAA's role on the preparation side that you were just mentioning, how much of that is preparation for uh, fire suppression and, and fire response versus uh, resilience and fire risk reduction? So we we are not telling you what to do with building materials, that is other agencies, but what we can provide is the projection information of what is expected in the future in terms of temperatures, water availability, winds, um, and that gets integrated into the overall planning for what needs to be managed within that. Um, I'll say a related program that we have right now is we're working with the American Society of Civil Engineers um, to look at what is, um, building codes and how building codes integrate climate information, because historically they look at past events and they quantify risk based on past events. But there's a need also to bring in what projections of the future might be if you want to build to the future, not build to the past. Um, and wildfire is coming into that as an interest of what is the likelihood or changes in likelihood potentially in regions that might not have experienced it before and need to consider that within their building codes. Great, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that instance or that uh, opportunity there to plug a report that the Bay Area Council Econ um, Foundation's California Resilience Challenge did with the city of uh, the town of Paradise post their fire to do exactly what you just mentioned. Uh, incorporate uh, building standard code changes adapted to wildfire um, and incorporate those changes and calculate what the impacts would be on risk reduction and on premiums to help ensure those communities remain insurable. Huge problem in California, as you know. Yeah. Um, and the the science, I, I often say our science only has value if it gets used and people figure out how to use it. And that's how we can reduce our exposure and adapt to these changing conditions is recognizing that if we're just backward looking with the data, we may miss emerging risks or exposures. Well, um, if we've got sea level rise next. Um, you know, I'm, why don't we start off sea level rise with a quick question. And uh, if, if folks put questions in the question box and I feel there's an opportunity to just pull one out. Um, do it context, I'm just going to do it. But otherwise, we'll wait to the end. So please get your questions in. Uh, Charles asks, does sea level rise data still look like about three feet or more than three feet by 2100? Um, yes, there there is a couple of feet. Um, we're mainly been trying to focus people on the one foot of sea level rise expected in your region by 2050. Um, uh, with that, with the work that we, do you want me to go through the work we have on sea level rise for the region? Yeah. Um, the, so the, you can go in and it provides it also at a local scale. You can go into something we have called the sea level rise viewer. And you can actually go onto the website and map your location and find your location and exactly where the sea level rise. And so it defers across the country by the end of the century, um, depending on where you are. Um, middle of the century for you, the average is around one foot by 2050. And the one foot by 2050 is pretty set. There's ranges by the end of the century based on how much um, greenhouse gases end up being in the atmosphere. Um, it's a little more set by 2050 though, based on the conditions that we have today and expectations for that to continue. Um, so uh, NOAA, I wanted to alert you to NOAA's National Center for Coastal Ocean Science. Um, in 2023, we announced $6.7 million in funding spent on 18 coastal resilience research projects across the nation. And this is really getting to how you build coastal resilience in a changing climate with sea level rise being one aspect. Um, eight of those, um, we have eight new ones and seven continuing awards under um, the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science Effects of Sea Level Rise program. So that program um, has been a very robust program across the nation for trying to deal with how much sea level rise will there be and how is that manifested um, in your region. And so these projects have been used for adaptation planning and management decisions. 
Um, and to evaluate how do you incorporate potentially nature-based solutions, so either restoration of wetland, mangroves, um, seagrass, kelp in the region. Um, so how can are those usable? Can you quantify their use and what their effects will be um, to mitigate the coastal vulnerabilities and risks associated with sea level rise? Um, through IRA, I'll also note that we funded the University of California, Irvine, along with University of Miami, approximately half a million to evaluate how nature-based solutions can empower equitable flood risk management in Los Angeles County, California. Um, there is a lot of work around, if you know the sea level is rising, you know what these effects will be, Where, what? how do your interventions then affect where the water goes and what can you do to plan to make sure that that is uh, managed? Um, we've also funded recently uh, Texas Arlington University of Arkansas Re in a similar way, how different shoreline adaptation perform. Um, so it's not enough just to know that the sea is going to rise. There's like very local work that needs to take place of how that manifests and then what are the interventions you need to do to reduce disruptions to people, to business operations, to society. Great. You know, uh, I've got another question here from the question box that just happens to align in this discussion in a slightly different angle vis-a-vis um, -vis groundwater. So, you know, the, the Bay Area has a lot of different groundwater tables ringing the Bay, and there's been some studies that have shown that as sea level rise goes up, uh, it's going to push up those groundwater tables too and potentially lead to dry weather flooding uh, in areas that don't normally flood because the groundwater is going to be pushed up closer to the surface and risk um, damaging infrastructure and whatnot. Does the question is, does do, are there any models or data products that assess risk to groundwater flooding? Um, there's some work related to that from our coastal centers around what we're seeing and doing on that along the coast. There's also work in collaboration. USGS leads some of that more of the work when you go more inland. Um, and so that's where we collaborate at that intersection. Uh, those effects, really, the research around it has been developing over the last 10 years heavily. Um, and so it's through the through the centers that I mentioned, NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, where it gets into those places where it's a sea level rise driven factor. Um, otherwise, more inland will be um, would be USGS. And I will say that the like part of the interesting part of where Miami and UC Irvine have partnered on Los Angeles is that Miami is already experiencing that. Um, at a much more rapid rate because they have limestone and their where their water tables are. When the sea sea is coming in and high tides, you have the flooding not just from the sea the tide, but you also have um, inland or along the shore. But you also have just the water comes up through the water table, and it's actually salty water there. Um, and that work and that understanding and where it's happening and monitoring it has been an active area of research in the last ten years. Great. It's interesting to see where different parts of the country are at different places uh, on this front. And for the questioner, uh, I, I'd refer you to a also a study by uh, the Aquatic Science Center that's part of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. Um, they did a study on shallow groundwater response to sea level rise in the Bay Area that also, um, this was not planned, um, funded by the Bay Area Council's California Resilience Challenge. Uh, they won a grant in 2020. Um, and so those results are up and maybe we can get uh, Rufus on the back end to drop a link to that study in the chat too. So uh, great. Now let's talk a little bit about extreme heat. Uh, it's not been a topic that's been uh, as forefront in the Bay Area. It's a huge topic in Southern California. But you know, as you know, there, um, you know not, there are quite a few people in the Bay Area who don't have air conditioning because it's traditionally been a temperate place. And, you know, a couple of years ago, San Francisco got up to 106 degrees for a few days. And so things can change quickly if you don't have air conditioning. So what Noah, what role does NOAA play in putting out, you know, emergency alerts uh, and monitoring changes in atmospheric temperature for heat? 
Yeah, I think you were mentioning, you know, that was part of the heat wave that they keep down that led to um, mass heat deaths. There was close to 700 heat deaths in the Pacific Northwest during that heat wave event that was um, the it was exceeded all the temperature records that we have for the last 100 plus years in that region um, and also exceeded expectations of from our paleo records of what it was over a thousand years. Um, so those extreme heat events are expected to increase around the country. And that is you you got the crux of it is that places that haven't experienced extreme heat have it also have a lot of vulnerability, particularly if you reach above 100 degrees multiple days in a row because people don't get a break from it and they don't have air conditioning. So they don't, staying in their home actually becomes dangerous at night if the temperatures don't decrease at night. And so, um, so with that, uh, there is a push towards creating heat plans across the country um, for dealing with heat, particularly in vulnerable places. Um, so NOAA on actually Earth Day of this year, um, with our longstanding partner CDC, we launched something called the Heat Risk Tool. Um, and so the Heat Risk Tool, if you if you search for it, you can find it online. It's a science-based approach usually using National Weather Service temperature forecasts as well as CDC heat health data. And it puts heat in a climatological context to understand um, upcoming events and how they relate to what has been experienced before. Um, to also then identify what the potential heat health impacts will be, and then highlight areas that may be more sensitive and more vulnerable and where interventions may need to happen um, as those forecasts go out. We also have, again, with CDC, heat.gov, which is the national, which is the website for a national integrated heat health information system, which again, like brings together tons of agencies across the government, federal government with NOAA and CDC as leads. And this is where you get the information on current and upcoming heat events, but also all the projection information and longer term um, analysis of heat events. Um, and this you know, also includes the links that new heat tracker and gives um, all the case studies of also how you build heat plans, what cities in different regions have done uh, to manage their heat risk. Additionally, and so that those are the things that would be directly for your region. Um, additionally, every year we hold a competition where uh, cities across the United States, and we even do a few international ones, apply and they apply for us to do a heat mapping program for their city during the summer. And we go out, we send people backpacks on bikes and cars measuring and monitoring heat and air pollution and humidity across their city. And we do this because you can get a lot of information from the climate data, from the models and from our satellite information, but you need to get very hyper-local when you want to understand the vulnerabilities of the community and understand the urban planning that needs to take place um, and where the most vulnerable places are. And so this heat mapping program that we do every year in the different cities that apply for it, they then get all that information. Um, but then they use that and they get technical assistance to use the science and information of, from what they get from that heat mapping, but also from the projection information to figure out what they need to do in the context of a changing climate, in the context of heat, to actually create actions in their cities to um, reduce exposure. And some of those things are simple if you need cooling centers in different places. Some of them are um, advice on urban planning, on where vegetation should be um, and where you should have it um, deployed because actually vegetation reduces the heat. Um, and then there's also plans of mapping where those vulnerable people are, um, the individuals who applied for this to have plans for how do you get those people to those cooling centers? How do you put those alerts out? How do you reach the community to make the community engage when you have a heat disaster unfolding? Now, what you mentioned earlier about giving people, you know, bikes and, you know, or uh, people with cycling, you know, you get some monitors to go ride around. Talk about the, the citizen science aspect of that. Is there a role to play for people yeah. who got a few bucks and they want to put, a, you know, some dongle on their house and report it to NOAA? Is that something that NOAA does? Oh. So yes, <laughs> so so that for that specific program, it is it is a call out the cities, you know, 
lead on it and then they do a citizen science call to bring people in to do all that work to make the monitoring we also have a citizen science plan we have a report that came out i want to say two years ago we've got, we've got some nerdy people in this audience who would probably be interested in so find, putting the thing on their house and helping you out um so you can find all of the citizen science for the federal government citizen science.gov um, but then, Noah, we also have a website, and I will make sure that we send the link to you of where to find the citizen science activities that we have across NOAA. Um, there are a number of them, um, and there's ones that you wouldn't expect, like, for one example, on the East Coast, when we have cold snaps and sea turtles uh, arrive cold stunned on the beach, we have people with private planes that fly the sea turtles to the sea turtle rehab center. Um, and so we have a ton of these different things. Um, that based on where you're located um, and what your resources are, you can contribute. Okay, great. I think we're going to try to get that link um, into the chat for, oh, there it is. Thank you, Rufus. Um, now let's, you know, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier. You talked about data is only as good um, if it gets put to use, or I butchered the quote, but that's the idea. Um, so I want to put that in the specific context of water data. So water right. data is something we're really passionate about the Bay Area Council. We co-sponsored legislation in 2016, AB 1755, by then Assembly Member Bill Dodd, the, the Water Data Consortium, uh, excuse me, the Open and Transparent Water Data Act. And it's uh, and the goal is to synthesize water data from disparate sources to make it more usable um, and to improve water management. So NOAA is obviously an extraordinary resource for all things water data related, but state and regional water agencies also produce an extremely valuable and, and tremendous amount of data on how water is used and when and for what purpose and by whom. But today, most of all of this data is siloed, right? It's siloed by agencies, which makes it harder for researchers and the public to get a full picture of what's really going on uh, on water. Because uh, you have to piece all of this information together. So how can NOAA ensure that the data that it creates is not only accessible, but easily integrated into data portals managed by the state or state partners? Yeah, um, what you are talking about there, I think, is a really important piece of what we do, which is our stakeholder engagement and maintaining dialogues with all the users. Um, and so we have continued discussions with stakeholders to make sure that our efforts and what we're producing and doing, make sure that, that information gets into those decision-making um, processes and key groups. Um, we actually um, put out a request for information on our equitable climate service action plan delivery. So how do we get information to everyone? Um, and we use that to actually build out an equitable climate services action plan about how we do stakeholder engagement and how we might change it differently going forward um, based on all the feedback we got back from that RFI. And for California in particular, I also want to highlight that we have California state climatologist, Dr. Michael Anderson. Um, he actually serves as one of the on our subcommittee of our science advisory board that also advises NOAA. So he's in the room talking about the importance of certain types of data or needs for certain types of data for the forecasting and planning that he does. And he actually is unique um, in that he, this position that he holds as California State Climatologist, it's actually um, supported by the Department of Water Resources for California. Um, and it's an act of collaboration that he also has with NOAA on making sure that climate data and services are available to the state use and then our um, actionable. And he also manages the state's atmospheric river research program and also serves as a subject matter expert on climate to DWR and across the state agencies. And so he is in the room making sure that we are taking the information. I actually saw him a few months ago. Um, and um, that feedback that we get from him, but also distribution through him to the data is how we make sure that we are working closely with the state. And I also just remembered, I should have mentioned this on sea level rise too, one of the, we have a coordinating group as well around um, coastal issues, and that's something called Sea Grant. So you've probably heard about land grant universities. Um, so NOAA has Sea Grant. 
that actually uh, makes sure that we coordinate information, but also funding on coastal issues. Um, and Sea Grant is unique in that it can bring together the different stakeholders, but also brings together the different federal, state, local funders of problems and academics to make sure that solutions, either research solutions are met or funding goes to specific coastal issues or uh, technological support in different regions. And so they're also an amazing advocate and partner regionally, um, plugging in within NOAA of what are the issues that need focus or what is science that is needed. And um, like an example of something that Sea Grant has been doing has been one on uh, blue carbon and coastal restoration about how do you restore uh, coastal ecosystems, but how do you quantify it with the carbon to potentially access carbon markets. Um, but that was a grassroots thing that came up through them that then they led at the national level to say this is an issue that we need some support on. Okay, great. Thank you. And, you know, I, I'm looking at the questions here. We're, we've got a ton of questions coming in. I'm going to get to those in just a second. But last question to you before I go to these sure. is um, let's let, talk a little bit about climate equity, right? We know this is a huge problem. Communities with fewer resources are predicted to be disproportionately affected by climate change in California. Those are some of the findings from a study that we helped partner with with, with BlackRock using some of their uh, in-house data a, a few years ago. Um, that was part of our, again, our climate uh, resilience initiatives that we've been working on. So we saw some of this a few years ago, um, you know, higher risk to uh, an economic vulnerability to drought, heat, wildfire, um, and flood. You mentioned uh, in your opening comments that NOAA is focusing on equity and deploying equity pilot projects across the U.S. Can you elaborate on a project in California? Um, I do not have a specific project in mind that I wanted to mention to you, but I wanted to say that we, we launched our climate service action plan and it just came out like last week, um, outlining all of the efforts that we're going to do across the entire country on ensuring that our, our information data services is equitable. And that has advanced awareness and accessibility for users of all disciplines and backgrounds. Number two, ensuring data equity in all of our products and services. Three, meeting local climate data needs. Four, expanding climate services to better incorporate socioeconomic impacts of climate change. And five, creating an enabling environment within NOAA. Um, and uh, actually going back to your example question, um, you know, it's examples of that. We've, we meet with the tribal leaders on different issues about what is needed in terms of data, but then um, for our BIL and IRA funding, there were grants and technical support to ensure that all communities could access that funding, particularly on the coastal resilience side. And there was um, technical support that was provided um, because increasingly we're finding um, as groups want to access uh, funding for coastal resilience, um, you know, the more sophisticated groups that are able to apply for a grant and have understand how to navigate the grant process are the ones that apply. And so technical support um, and outreach was done to make sure that we were accessing more groups and that they were able to actually get their applications through. Um, and so this also has changed some of the grants process where instead of just giving out the final grant, their grant stages so that there can be technical support, review response, and then the next tranche of funding to actually do the work because we're finding the groups need that help. And then in the event that those groups don't get the final funding, we then can have silver medal, what one can call silver medal winners where they might not get the funding from us, but they might get funding from others to actually complete the project that they need. Um, because now they've gone through this process to develop a really cohesive plan for what they need to fund. And I think we'll see, um, I think we'll see that in the adaptation resilience space um, you know, these groups will get the technical support often through the federal government. And I think they'll be interested in it um, for municipal development um, and also nonprofit space for developing out coastal resilience projects. Okay, great. Thanks. And now let me go straight to some of these questions here. 
does NOAA's projections include business as usual versus mitigations for things like sea level rise and wildfire? A very untapped resources and wildfire risk reduction is the use uh, of waste, woody, biomass, and forest residues as a sustainable aviation fuel feedstock. This could be wildly helpful as a driver for investments slash prioritization of these important interventions that can also drive the economy and greenhouse gas mitigations. Yeah, this um, we use broad amount of scenarios to be able to create our projections of climate information. Um, on the specific comment of SAF, we don't, um, there are, you know, there's research that people do. I don't know of any specific in our agency on SAF that is, um, but it, you know, is one area to think through about waste and waste management. Um, the scenarios that I talk about when we look at projections to know what the future of climate looks like, those are projections of expectations of greenhouse gases, land use, um, and uh, other aerosols to be able to quantify what the future of climate looks like using our climate models. They're not, they don't have that integrated feedback with like putting in SAF or no SAF to look what the climate looks like in the future. Okay, now let me bring it back to, um, let's see, we've got a question. Is there data on the prediction of sea level rise? We went into that a little bit. I believe it was you know, one foot, roughly a foot by 2050 is pretty well cooked and out to 2100. We're looking a couple of different scenarios, two to three feet. Is that right? Yes. Um, and I really encourage you to use the sea level rise viewer that allows you to go to your exact location and see what the sea level rise is expected in your zone and what the different scenarios show. Um, it's really helpful too, because it does the mapping at a local level and it goes onto Google Maps so you can actually see at a local scale, what that looks like. And the important part I also want to add to that, which we were kind of getting into with the aquifer, is that um, sea level rise and its manifestations have all these other effects um, that we are now starting to research more and more of. Okay, sea level rise, and now what does that do to the water table? What does that do to the availability of water if you have salt water into your aquifers? What does that do in terms of um, you know, there's questions and we're working with um, utilities through EPRI um, around, you know, what happens to infrastructure if suddenly it has saltwater intrusions because saltwater is corrosive and like, where do you move your lines or where do you move some of your assets? Um, so it's not just thinking about where the water is going to be, but then all these downstream effects and how it may manifest, not just by where average height is going to be. Okay, great. And I'm going to have a follow-up question here on Karen, from Karen. What work is underway to find funding for all the resilience work required? What role will valuing... I've got a, a fire that I'm about to put out here in a second. What work is... What role will valuing natural capital play in funding resilience? And you may not know that Metropolitan Transportation Commission uh, had an estimate about $110 billion for climate resilience for sea level rise adaptation in the Bay. So can you talk a little bit about funding for these projects? And while you do, I'm going on mute and go and put the camera off for a minute while I handle this. Hi, I've been there. Um, so I, I wanted to um, mention the Community Disaster Resilience Zone Act. Um, there was a law that was signed in December of 2022. Um, and it focuses on you requiring FEMA to utilize natural hazard risk assessment to identify census tracts, which are most at risk from the effects of natural hazards and climate change. Um, and there's data on that. Uh, FEMA has put out that information of where are, and they we refer in shorthand to those zones as cedar zones in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. And you can find a map of that if you just search um, community disaster resilience zones in FEMA to find out where those regions are and where um, places are mo most at risk. Um, and, and in terms of funding, there there's mandates to funding in those places um, and uh, coordinate efforts around how do you quantify what those risks are most at risk in those places. Um, and across the entire U.S., we also have a product uh, called Camera, which is uh, uh, where you can actually go onto it um, and you map um, it's the Climate Mapping Resiliency Toolkit um, where you can 
actually map where the hazards are, what is the expectations for the future in terms of projections and risks across various climate information. Okay, great, thank you. And a good, great question, Karen, thanks. And let's get a question from Paul here. How do you engage the public to stimulate their interest in addressing the climate crisis without freaking them out by its scope and scale? This is more of a like, um, what is in your heart and how do you communicate type of question than the science question. Um, we, with our communications teams, we are always trying to give people the tools of the information that they need. And um, I say, you know, it may seem daunting at times that there's this change and this change is happening and we have to handle it. But um, the science that we have of forecast predictions and projections, they give us some certainty of what the future holds, particularly in the near term of the months, hours, or hours, weeks, months, years, um, in the near term, that they give us certainty in a way that nothing else does. Um, and so we can take that information and use it and adapt to it um, so we can reduce what those impacts might be. And I think it's, you know, the knowledge is power that we just need to put to action um, of how to handle these uh, changes that we'll see. Great, thank you. And let's go to a question from Liz. Any ideas on policy development to support reducing greenhouse gas emissions? California wants to slash emissions uh, to 40% of 1990 levels by 2030, and the state is not on track to meet that commitment per Beacon Economics. Uh, the study report from Beacon said emissions are only falling about 1.6% per year, resulting in California not meeting the emission reduction goal till 2047, uh, about 20 years behind our current 2030 goal. So what do you think on low-hanging fruit, moonshots on reducing GHG emissions in the state? Um, I will not wade into reducing emissions at your location, but I will say that we monitor and provide all the information of where they are happening locally. Um, and you can look up, if you're curious about that, there's information on the National Greenhouse Gas Strategy that was released last November of we're able to monitor um, by location where those emissions are coming from. Okay, thank you. And that makes sense. Now, you referred earlier in the discussion, we were talking about extreme heat events, um, mapping, uh, heat mapping tools. Aaron asks, has San Francisco conducted this heat mapping? Do you know how, to what extent the city has done it? Off the top of my head, I do not recall. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll get back. Uh, does the, no, this is an anonymous question. Does the National Weather Service have any plans to update their heat index calculation based on the recent Lou and Romps papers? which are more mathematically grounded and avoid the current polynomial extrapolations that led to underestimations at the higher end of up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I was thinking about both of these studies you know, the whole time. And so maybe uh, you can share, if you're familiar with these, um, put this a little bit in layman's terms, um, but you know, what's, the what's the status on you know, the latest science that you're using for some of your projections? Yeah, for for heat and for heat risk, we we have been involving in how we explain what heat risk is. And uh important point to make is it's and I think there was a Saturday Night Live skit on this at one point. Like it's not just the heat, it's the humidity. Um I think there was also like stupid in there. Um, but so it's um from like in a lot of people's minds. Um, but in action, if you just know what the temperature is, it's not enough. You also need to know what the humidity is. You need the, uh, the intersection on that because humans, we cool off through sweat, through perspiration. And so if it's too humid and it's, and you get to a certain temperature outside, your body can't no longer cool itself. And that's when you get heat stroke and that's when you get heat stress and that's when you get heat death. And so across the country, we didn't hit those days very often. And so originally the many of the reporting was just on temperature, but now there's also these heat indexes to include um, that information that comes from the fact that there's humidity and that there's a certain uh, point in time where humans can't have activities outside. 
Um, and so we've been changing that around the country. And actually, um, it was tested last summer. It's gone into effect that now these new heat indexes that also include humidity are included. That's why we also put out this new tool and this new work with CDC was thinking about heat also is very local issue. It's very different if you have a hundred degree day in San Francisco than if you have a hundred degree day in Phoenix, Arizona, where they're used to dealing with that. It's also probably a lot more humid in San Francisco if you get a heat day than it is um, in Arizona. And so putting out that information, those heat indexes and being able to do that communication around what it means and how long you can be outside has been part of this big push. And part of it also is a communication around um, you know, how long you can have those activities outside before you have issues. And uh, we are doing that communication because the big part of it is that people haven't experienced the heat that they're going to start experiencing. And so when you put out a heat alert, people are like, oh, I was fine during that last heat event. But these new heat events are going to be fundamentally different than the heat events we saw before. Okay, great. Now, let me ask you another question. Could you please let us know if there are any tools that farm workers could uh, could use for heat information? Is the information for urban heat island mapping available in other languages? Um, yes, some of the information can be found on heat.gov. I do believe we also have Spanish language information and we have sample guidelines for what to do during certain heat events um, to be able to uh, create plans. Um, for particularly vulnerable um, populations, which includes outdoor workers of which farmers are a part. Uh, Dr. Caffrey, I'll, I'll step in uh, for Adrian. I think he's uh, corralling a youngster, but uh, thanks again. Uh, another question will just kind of bounce around here a little bit, but uh, from Keith Ensminger, are, are there studies about how saltwater intrusion will affect coastal aquifers with sea level rise like the Sacramento uh, San Joaquin Delta? Um, there are bodies of research around that, um, particularly on the Delta. And the Delta, it's not just the saltwater intrusion that may happen due to sea level rise. It's also, I was alluding to it, it's if you get a multi-year drought event where you have low freshwater flows, um, there could be saltwater intrusion into the Delta that could affect the aquifer. That was something that was really high in everyone's mind a couple of years ago at the, at the real low lows. Um, after because of the multi-decade drought. Um, there is a lot of active research on that, particularly in the state of California across the UC system on how to manage that, how to plan for that, how to deal with it. And I do know that it is a high, um, a high topic um, in your office of DWR. Okay, I think we've got about, let's see, we've got five minutes. And I think we've got six or seven questions. Let's see if we can rattle through these. Uh, urban heat mapping, what are the blockers for scaling the program? Is it the ability to get more remote sensors? Is it is it technical difficult, technically difficult to apply the data in the model? How do we scale this up? Uh, for us, we are, you know, we have a certain amount of funding and that has ha that has been how we've been able to set how many cities that we do every year. And people time for being able to manage all of that. Um, but we are Pro doing staff capacity. Yes, um, I have seen academic institutions start to do their own heat mapping in their own regions to be able to do very customized work, um, but it has been exploding in interest in the recent years because we're now also starting to see the effects of doing these mapping campaigns, both nationally and internationally. Um, and the first heat resilience officers across the country have been a part often of the and internationally have been a part of these mapping campaigns. And so they're seeing the value of doing them. And so now that is feeding back on the interest in the program. Okay, and you know, a related question, because this goes back to the citizen science and the dongle, you know, getting a dongle for your house to, to censor heat, temperature, precipitation, uh, uh, et cetera. A question from Aaron, how do we make sure the dongle is calibrated? We find with AQ monitors, they're often inconsistent and misleading. How do we make sure that this is feeding you the info in the form that format that you need? That is the reason that we manage these heat mapping campaigns is that we are able to make sure that we have the precision that we need to be able to do this work. 
And, um, you know, with any, with any science program and monitoring program, there needs to be a decision of what are the requirements for the precision of the information. And that needs to go into the analysis of the information that you get to understand um, how it should, should or should not be applied. And that is part of the, re we have stricter requirements based on our experience and based on our use of the data of how we manage these types of programs. Okay, another question. Uh, also related to citizen science. In addition to citizen science activities, how are folks at NOAA working to connect the general public with research done and the different centers engaging in research across California and the country? Um, our, our staff engage through the media. They engage through their regional centers. Um, so we have the Western regional team, um, which engages across with different groups. We also have CAPRISA programs, and there is a, a CAPRISA program that covers the West um, that does that engagement. We engage through our state climatologists. So I, I said Michael Anderson for you, um, through Sea Grant, and Sea Grant does many different activities across along the coasts. Um, and then through our various funded partners and scientists. Um, their engagement is through public, through various projects that they have, but also through um, the media engagements they do. And if you and events like this, and if you have any other ideas that you think that we are not taking advantage of, I welcome um, the feedback. We certainly appreciate you being on events like this and helping educate our members. Let's try to get a couple more questions in before we have to go. Uh, I love this one. What is the current level of concern about the potential collapse of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Hopefully I got that right. Yes, uh, and AMOC for short. Um, there is a lot of science and understanding what the future of that is and how it is changing. We know directionally it is slowing down, um, but it is a scientific topic that we're assessing about how do you predict that? How do you know that? The studies have that in decades or centuries. Um, and I would say an important component of that is making sure that we not only assess and quantify what the future of an ocean current is in one location um, in the Atlantic, but also what all the impacts of that would be across Europe and across the United States. Um, and for the U.S., one of the impacts that we have um, seen through our research studies is that it rapidly increases sea level rise along the East Coast when that does take place. So it amplify the sea level rise. Okay, great. Well, uh, I we have a few questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, maybe we can get you to answer them, some of those offline, and we can set send out answers as part of our, um, our roundup to our members. But I want to thank you, thank NOAA, uh, and thank the Department of Commerce for partnering with us on uh, this webinar series. It's been great to have you, Dr. Kapnick. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for your leadership on dealing with these issues and trying to figure out the solutions so we make sure that we have government funding and private capital going towards all these problems. Absolutely. And let us know next time you're in the Bay Area personally. We would love to have you uh, over on the Klamath and we can do an in-person conversation next time. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you uh, to everyone who dialed in. This, video, this webinar uh, is being recorded. We'll send out a link when it's all uh, set up and uploaded online. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.